Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, I am Mariana and I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to this channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. Today, our guest is Lee Poston and he will talk about how MDT and GOTA are the perfect fit. Lee is a physical therapist with almost 30 years of experience, McKenzie diplomat, go to movement specialist and owner of Therapeutic Associates of Maui. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hi, Lee. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Man, I'm good. How are you? Good to see you finally after all these misconnections in our schedules, huh? Yes, I'm glad to have you here and let's jump right in. So tell us just a little bit about yourself, your career, your background, and how did you get to where you are right now? All right. Um, yeah, I'm a physical therapist uh, in Maui. Uh, graduated PT school in um, 1992. Tennessee State University, and um, had a job at this big hospital right out of school, and um, it was really kind of cool, um, doing a lot of acute care at the time, but I was covering uh, football, high school football, and um, actually, the, the my high school coach was coaching this team nearby, not in my high school anymore, and he found out I was back, and he said he wanted me on his coverage, which is kind of awesome, and they were a big school, and um, so I traveled, did that for a couple of years, but while I was doing it, I was working with my buddy, uh, Jimmy Cross, and he said, hey, Lee, you should uh, look into this new job um, with, the, with the hospital. It's a contract job that they were put, placing a therapist in McKenzie, Tennessee, if you can believe that. That was my first job. Uh, and so, so I got a raise. It was going to be a drive, but I, I got a raise. It was really kind of cool because I was doing outpatient. like I, I mean, I, I was doing uh, inpatient, like I said. And it was a cool job. It was an outlying, ten, uh, outlying hospital in a, in a small rural town. And, but they had this 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 orthopedic surgeon that came in from Vanderbilt and did um, surgeries. He was a knee and shoulder guy. He was actually the um, their Dr. Kurt Spindler. He was their um, the Vanderbilt sports medicine program head, and he traveled with the team. And somehow, before I got there, they had this the PTA there had had finagled this little contract with him, so he was doing all their athletes. And that's probably the re reason why they placed me there is they were trying to get me to get some of those surgeries to the, the hospital I worked at. It was awesome. I was there for about a year and a half uh, doing outpatient, thinking I was all that in a bag of chips right out of school. Got a $10,000 raise, like I said, and um, lots of knees and shoulders, just sports medicine all over the place. And that surgeon was so cool. Uh, he made me think that all orthopedic surgeons, all surgeons were this way. But I could literally call him if he was in surgery. So he'd have someone hold the phone up to his ear because uh, he cared that much about his patients. And, um, and that, of course, just like any clinic, I had um, back patients in there. And it, if they got better, great. And if they didn't, it wasn't me because, you know, I, I was really good. You know, it's about as good as you can be coming out of PT school, right? Um, but because um, I, I knew what, what most people know coming out of school, hot packed uh, ultrasound, e-stem, you know, soft tissue mold, and, which is not much of anything. So but I did that for about a year and a half, and there got to be a little bit too much uh, politics between the three, the, the three hospitals, the hospital that placed me there the little McKenzie Methodist Hospital in Vanderbilt. And so I just decided, hey, I'm young and single. I'm going to start traveling. So I did some travel assignments in North and South Carolina, just happened to, to luck out and, and discover uh, this gig in, in Maui in uh, inpatient. And um, um, I just happened, I just kind of great timing because there was only one other person up for the job. So um, I guess I kind of ruined that person's plan because I did the interview and I got the job. And I was there for about three years, uh, about two and a half years of uh, with the, the traveling stuff. And it was in acute care, which acute care is awesome as far as traveling, because it's very mindless. I mean, it's very easy. All you're just basically doing is getting people up and out of, out of the hospital. So it really wasn't really much hard work. And as a traveler, they just threw all the hard patients to you, which is great. I was a big, tall guy, big guy, so I could handle any of the, the bigger, harder patients they have. But, um, so I did that for a couple of years. And, um, then they told me after about, after a while, they said, Hey Lee, we, we, we'd love for you to stay, but we're not going to renew any more contracts because 
and they were trying for years as a state run hospital just to get more FTEs. And they finally, finally got an FTE. So they were going to hire me, hire a staff therapist. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll stay. Cause I really wasn't, I, I came on as a traveler there for three months in 1997 and I just kept staying and I, and I ended up never leaving. But then because I got out of, um, that contract job or that they stopped the contract, you know, it basically cuts my pay, cuts my housing stipend. And luckily I'd got a car from them because I, instead of doing rental cars every month, I would just kind of get them to give me the money. So I ended up just buying a cheap car. And, um, and I was dating a girl at the time, you know, things happened for a reason. I guess I was dating this girl at the time who was a physical therapist and she was working with the Kaiser and, um, two of her buddies, they decided, Hey, we're going to go to see this, this McKenzie course. Well, you want to go with us? And I'm and sure I'm going to go, you know, I'm thinking I need to sharpen my skills anyway, cause I'm trying to, you know, now that I'm not making as good of money, I'm going to try to get into look for an outpatient gig. And about, I knew about as much as anybody knew about McKenzie, right? That couple of years out of school, you know, it's, that, it's that extension stuff. Let's go check it out. And um, so I went and did that, but I didn't know that how much that's going to change my life. I said this many times that if I was still doing regular physical therapy, I learned in PT school, I'd have blown my brains out a long time ago. Um, but I'm still on just as on fire as I am, you know, 1999 when that first class under Miller. I mean, it's a perfect storm, I think, too. But I had Mark Miller for a part A. And, um, it, you know, Mark Miller is, uh, you know, is pretty much on the Mount Rushmore of, uh, of instructors, right? And so I get there and just he basically just kind of rocked our world. Basically said, this is what McKenzie is in a nutshell. Lots of literature to back up centralization and, and, and outcomes of, of, of MDT. And, um, and so he basically said, this is what's going to happen. You know, the, you're looking for centralization, restore end range, blah, blah, blah. But essentially what he said was going to happen. First couple of patients happened right before us. So we're like, you know, pretty, pretty impressed. And he had a couple of hard patients over the course of the uh, course of the weekend that weren't quite as straightforward, which was also awesome to kind of see how he manages those. But I mean, right away, I'm just realizing that, man, I don't, I don't know anything. Uh, and this is pretty cool stuff. And so we're leaving out the first day uh, that, that my little crew as four of us. Lori was my girlfriend at the time. And then Kevin and, and uh, Robert and Kevin was this Canadian. This is the funniest thing I think is because he's from Canada, you know, Can Canadians are really strong and uh, you know, they're, they're a lot more manually driven than we are in the States. And, um, and I really considered him a pretty good therapist and uh, more so than me because he knew what to do with his hands. And we're walking outside, I'm driving, Kevin's in the back seat and we're just silent for a few minutes. And Kevin goes, I don't know about you guys, but I'm digging this. And then we just started chattering like a bunch of little old hens and, um, but I mean, it just changed my world. And then I had, um, an A and a B with Miller and then an A and B with Herbawi, which is another, uh, you know, great instructor on the Mount, Mount Rushmore. And then I had Wadi for a part C. And then that's a kind of interesting story because Wadi did a part C. And then by the time we did, cause they did two A's and two B's. And by the time we got to D, um, there's only going to be six of us. You know, there's four of us from Maui, counting another girl, the fifth girl from Maui that was started working with those guys at Kaiser. And this one guy, Dave, uh, we call him Dave the Wave, um, Air Force Dave. And um, luckily, he was still around with us as well because Lieutenant Kathy Zerowell, who was the one who was always bringing the, um, the courses to um, uh, Oahu at, uh, at Tripler Air Force Base, um, she got moved. She got transferred. So then Dave said, hey, I'll, I'll host this course. But I mean, who's going to come and teach a course to six people? But luckily, we got to got to be good friends with Wadi, and he said, "Hey, I'll come do it. I'll come piggyback this on my way to uh, Ottawa, it was the Ottawa conference in 2001." And so he did that. And and, and, it, and when I look back on my history, I mean, Wadi's kind of played in Grant Watson out of New Zealand, kind of played a huge part in my where I'm at today. Because had he not done that, being in Hawaii, I don't know, I'd have had to wait for another series of A's through D to come to come again, or I'd have had to go to to Oahu. I'm sorry, to the mainland which would have been kind of hard because um, 2002 is when I got certified. Uh, that's another story. Wadi kind of met us in, uh, in uh, Tucson to get certified. He kind of met us the night before and kind of went through all the techniques. So that was awesome. But had he not done that, it was 2003 is when we got certified, 2002. or well, 2003 is when I started opening my practice. So, you know, I, you know, just with the, the expenses and the timing, you know, it might have set me back for a, a few years. So that really worked out really well. And then I got certified and, and then that Don Wadi, he kept, he was, in my, he was just chattering in my ear all the time. When are you going to get certified? I mean, when are you going to go to the diploma program? When are you going to, you know, every time I was turning around, he was nagging. No, I'm just kidding. But um, he stayed on me. And when I got certified, Miller came back for some courses. Herbawi came back. Uh, Wadi came back. And every time somebody would come by us to Oahu, I would always, um, they had a new, new uh, person that would kind of bring him. Uh, 
uh, Ellie, I think was her name. And um, I would always just ask, hey, can I come hang out with you guys? Can I come help out? And, that, and I'd recommend that to everybody. Don't just think that when you get certified, we, you don't know much when you're certified. So just keep learning. Keep learning. Because I thought I knew a lot until I got the diploma program and they just break you down and build you back up. But keep going to the courses because different instructors teach different things. And the courses themselves have continued to evolve over the years as well. So I kept doing that. And I finally did make the commitment, especially since the more and more I was, I was in the practice by myself. I mean, I started my practice. Um, I, was, I, I didn't know if I was going to be able to pull it off just because of the expense, because of bringing someone to cover for me and so on and so forth. But I just feel like I had to do it. And so I finally did it in 2008 and then in 2009 uh, in Austin and you know, set for the the, uh, the exam in Rio in uh, 2009. But interesting little story there. I almost flunked out of, of, the, of the diploma program because the day I got on the plane, I was trying to start a CrossFit box and I had a partner who tried to commit suicide. Huh? So literally, oh she's just trying to call me the day when I was going through the airport security and um, I didn't answer. And then um, I tried to call her when I got back through security and um, she didn't answer. And um, when I get to to Texas, I get a call from her with a raspy voice because she had tried to hang herself like that, and she um oh my just goodness. calling me from, she just calling me from uh, from intensive care, and and so right off the bat, I am um, conflicted as to what to do. Do I need to turn around and go back and see what's going on and yada yada yada? And um, but obviously I was there, and I'd already you know pretty much uh, didn't spare the expense to go and all that stuff, so I had to, I kind of stuck it out, and and then my family ended up coming out as well which was another awesome thing, but it was a hard thing because um, they were in Dallas with my, or Fort Worth there with my family. And I'd kind of go back and forth to see them. And Scott found out about that. And he said, Hey, just come and have them stay at my house. And, and um, cause he's going to, he is actually, he actually left the last two or three weeks of the, uh, of my course to or my, my diploma program to go to Europe with his family. And, and that was awesome, but it wasn't awesome because it was just too much. I mean, the, the poem program is pretty intense. And so, I, and, and the reason why, the other reason why is I had a newborn kid. I mean, my, my son named Mackenzie, actually, um, he was born in December the previous year. So, uh, so I had them there and um, kind of left Maud, me, my partner, my, a little young Indian girl who was my partner, who was awesome. Um, but I, I've stayed with my family uh, the last several weeks. And like I said, that actually would probably cause more harm than good because it's just, you know, it's just pretty stressful. In addition to just the guilt of, you know, am I doing the right thing even being here? And then Michelle Sprouse, Michelle Miller, slapped me around, took me under her wing the last few weeks and, and, and got my head in, in gear and, and I pulled it out. So that's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, got certified and um, just, you know, I've just always over the years have continued just any any course, any conference I can get to, any of the courses that come to Wahoo, if I know the instructors, I'll come over even still, even to this day. But uh, um, But I've been in practice since 2003. And a um, couple of clinics here, and that's it. Long story, I guess not. So, I mean, uh, not so short, but a long story. That's where I'm at today. That's awesome. So I know you love MDT and has this big history with it. Our topic today is a little bit different. So I want to know how do you use MDT and Gota? Because I know you are also a big Gota fan. So. Uh, do you think that they complement each other? So how is that combination? How do you use that in your practice? Yeah, I mean, they totally complement each other. Uh, what, what, what GOTA is, um, I know you've had, uh, had Lynn on here and had Scott on here who are both uh, MDT and uh, GOTA. And um, basically, if you think about what GOTA is, it's just basically mechanically changing or you're ch trying to change the mechanics of how we move. You know, when you start moving the wrong way, we literally tear our bodies up over time, uh, not really realizing because it, it just seems normal to us. You know, our body is so amazing. It will let us sit in bad posture, lift the wrong way, do the wrong things until it just can't take anymore. And then something gives out, you know. Um, and so, that, you know, it's amazing. I was, I was having this chat with just a patient just uh, the other day. It's a, like a 72-year-old um, uh, pharmacist who's still working. And a very young 72 years old, except for back pain, which she's seen before and she's responding really well. But she's got a knee problem on that. She's a relevant lateral and she's got a knee problem, a degenerative knee on the side that we're, you know, we're pushing away from. So that relevant lateral. So, it, it, you know, is there some coincidence there? Well, I think so. And I asked her, I said, so why do you think your knee's worn out? She said, I don't know. You tell me. And I said, you know, cause we were having a discussion. She, she didn't, she's a pharmacist. So she's not doing anything, uh, uh, you know, anything to, with her job to wear her knee out. She didn't do anything sports-wise to wear out, so there's no real explanation. I also had a teacher that I use this example all the time as well. 
a retired school teacher who, again, a school teacher, no history of sports or anything. She had both of her knees replaced. So how do we explain that uh, for no apparent reason, like insidious onset back pain, other than the fact that our, our own movement is doing it. And, um, and so, you know, if you, on day one, I'm still, you know, I'm still on fire today as much as I am when I first, in 1999 on MDT, because again, I always, all my friends that know me and Lynn made me a great shirt of it says, uh, uh, you know, Mackenzie's a genius and she made me a great shirt in, in our uh, diploma core, uh, diploma conference a few years back. It's got a picture of a uh, Robin McKenzie with uh, Einstein hair on that says that E equals MDT squared. Uh, it's always say that Robin McKenzie's a genius and uh, anybody that can make me look good in the clinic every day has got to be a genius, right? But um, I'm still just as on fire as I was in 1999 because, I mean, the, it works. I mean, we all talk about, you know, wanting to seek and destroy derangements per Miller. And it's just that, that power of having somebody that no one else can fix. And um, they walk in your clinic and, um, you know, on day one, you start making these changes. Well, we can make that, that, that uh, improvement even better when we clean up movement patterns that get them there in the first place. I mean, in MDT, we're all about correcting their posture and making sure that they're consistent with the home exercise program. Well, if we are still sitting front, you know, sitting kind of gets this front chain dominant, which is a compressive position for your spine in that we're sitting all the time. Then we stand up and we're also in our, in, in the front chain. Well, front chain standing is, is, is just as bad as sitting. It's just not as much force, but if we're standing for long periods of time, the force, um, can cause our derangement to, we can cause ourselves to re-derange. And, um, you know, is it, you know, you start doing the better, worse section and, and it's a different mindset now. Is it, is walking and, and standing and walking, making things worse potentially with walking because there's a relevant, uh, a relevant lateral or are they just too, um, too woda, you know, worst of all time where their toes are turning out and their inside ankle bones are collapsing type of thing. And so, um, that's that all that whole mindset sh mindset has shifted somewhat because without a doubt, when I'm reducing someone on day one, um, I don't always necessarily uh, I'm not always able to, able to do the full go to presentation on day one because I'm trying to get them, you know, do the McKinsey exam first. But everybody at the, at the very least on day one, I'm trying to fix everybody's feet because it just makes so much sense if you're towing out. And you're, when you tow out, your inside ankle bone has got to collapse a little bit. It just has to because you're moving forward. And that collapse of that ankle is going to take your, the arch collapsing. It's going to take the ankle with it. It's going to take the knee with it and so on and so forth. And, um, and I can't tell you how many patients I've had when that's all I've done, especially when it, it really comes in handy too with the, with the slow responders or mechanical non-responders, that they, they come back and that just fixing their feet, they can already tell the difference. And it just makes sense once you understand the concept because you're, when you're when you're towing out your 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 leg bone your shin bone your tib fib is literally moving is is in one direction pointing in one direction and your thigh bone your femur is moving in the other direction they want to move together and they need to move together but they can't because that front chain dominant behavior the heel stuck sticks in the ground um, it's forced to kind of stay where it's at so you've got these bones trying to do two opposite things so it just grinds the knee down all the time so how does it how do I use them together as they it's phenomenal at um, a giving me uh, more tools to help patients understand what they've got to do to keep these arrangements reduced, and then B, it gives me lots of more functional uh, positions uh, to, to start helping with patients that are a little bit slower to respond and or mechanical non-responders to uh, to um, get them get them back to where they need to be as far as you know uh, whether they're just uh, athletics or just um, you know masters type of stuff or just uh, you know like I, I want to walk I want to play some tennis you know recreational you know type of thing but it just helps you so much to get get those movement patterns back under control and once they just start moving differently and it takes some time the older you are uh, and, and also I probably don't have anywhere near the success Lynn has in in uh, New Orleans because my population I have a lot of work with comp and the buy-in it's, it's hard to get people to buy into to MDT sometimes because it's you know MDT is not fluff. Uh, it is basically putting the patient to work, teaching them to, to fix themselves type of thing. And so that's kind of what, what GOTA is. And she's dealing with people that are, you know, high school athletes trying to become first string or trying to get a college scholarship or college athletes trying to get the pros and the pros trying to stay in the pros where all the money is. Uh, but when I get somebody that buys in, man, I mean, there's, there's no denying that they get better faster, get better and they're able to maintain things better.
Um, so, so yeah, they work hand in hand like a glove. Awesome. So do you think that your patient's recurrence rate went down since you start using Goder to keep them from rearranging again or to maintain them better for longer? Well, that's hard to say, I would say, as far as when we, when we get rid of them, uh, you know, coming back or not. But I mean, without a doubt, um, as soon as, um, whether it be day one, depending on how in-depth day one and evaluation, I, mean, I, uh, you know, I give everybody an hour evaluation. So depending on how in-depth I have to go to, you know, how difficult they are to get under control uh, de determines how much I'm able to, to start to go to file them, so to speak, on day one. Uh, but without a doubt, once they buy into it, yeah, absolutely. Because and it just, just makes sense. I mean, like I said, once you understand the concept of what, what these guys in your arms are talking about, I mean, Coach Gilly, Coach uh, Robin McKenzie, genius, Coach Gill's a genius. Just the very, the very fact that this guy who's a businessman, no medical training whatsoever, but he's able to fix himself. And uh, I think it's kind of interesting to point out the dude's like 6'4", 260. He'll tell yourself he's probably doesn't eat as healthy as he used to anymore, but he's a big guy. He always was a big guy. And he's still, after this history of supposedly needing his back fused back in his you know late 20s, early 30s, Dude still does well. I think he says six to nine, six to eight sprint triathlons still every year at six four two sixty. So that's the big Clydesdale division, and um, and he's playing golf. You know, you know he'd he'd play golf all day every day if he could, and I think he does pretty much play golf as many times as he can a week. Uh, and again, I think that's pretty impressive to be such a big guy with his history. And we know, you know, he he always talks about having degenerative disc disease. Well, we all know at MDT everybody's got degenerative disc disease to a certain degree. But he had it bad enough that they were really, really, want, really wanting to fuse his back. So he definitely had it bad enough. But, um, but um, you know, that, that in and of itself is pretty impressive. So um, I, I lost my train of thought there. Where are we going? But, uh, no, yeah. no I, I'm, I'm just curious to ask you now. So how did you, uh, why did motivate you to go through the GOTA training? How did you find out? Was that Lean's fault? <laughs> that yeah lynn is the corrupter yeah well I, so i had a crossfit box remember and i um 2014 i was at a competition and uh clean and jerk ladder you know where you lift from the ground to your chest to your shoulders and then drive it up and um i had i was pretty tired from a previous workout and um you try to do that as fast as you can and i got to a weight that's pretty heavy for me but doable 225 and I got the weight up and I was tired. And I, as soon as I got ready to jerk it up, my left leg uh, collapsed on me. Inside ankle bone load, uh, non-contact injury with a load. And, oh, my um, goodness. And I thought, I mean, I damaged my, I, I knew I damaged my knee pretty bad. But after I did the MRI and had to finish the competition, which I did, which was not pretty. But, um, um, you know, CrossFitters, you know, that were, they're a crazy bunch. But um, I got an MRI and the orthopedic surgeon friend of mine who was on Oahu that read it, he thought initially I tore my uh, – patella tendon but i knew i hadn't because i could still extend my knee and it had like most mris it had like freaking 10 things on there cartilage tears and all this stuff but luckily i knew none of that stuff was relevant because my pain was specifically on my underneath my kneecap and so it did say both of my knees that the, 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 the cartilage under my kneecap was shredded and i could literally just thump like i had my, my little my son at the time just elbow me run into my my kneecap with his elbow and it put me on the ground. It was just so sharp pain. And I cleared the spine. I had, I think it late, later on, I think down the line, I had a relevant ladder that helped contribute to the problem now in hindsight, but I cleared the spine. I flexed like I'll get out. I, you know, checked the hip, checked the, checked the knee and just nothing helped. And, um, and I just, over time, I'm just going to remodel this thing. And I got back over time, you know, 2014, 2019, I got to where I could squat back up to about two, 250, but it, man, it hurt. I dreaded every time going down in the hole and coming back up. And um, so three years in a row with, with Lynn and Jason Ward at Mechanical Care uh, uh, everywhere, give them a shout out there. Uh, we would go to Peru and we'd do this, um, the mission. And um, Lynn and I and Jason were all CrossFitters. So we'd all, you know, there's hiking involved and we'd always go to Machu Picchu and then we'd do CrossFit workouts. And I was just always crying about my knee. Uh, and, and then the last year, 2019 was the last year I think we did it. And then um, that's the, the Within just a few months later, we all had went to, or Lynn and I went to a world of hurt with Annie and Melissa. And uh, she said, Lee, I got something for you. She had just started to go to stuff. I got something for you. Because she heard me again, you know, crying about my knees, right? <laughs> and uh, so she showed me the rocker, the child rocker, which is basically, if you watch toddlers, that's how they sit. They don't sit in chairs. They don't ever sit in chairs until we force them to sit in chairs, ruin them. 
And um, so you're just basically sitting on your hands and knees and you, your, your feet are pointed, your big toes are pointing, you're getting those heels away, that heels away all day, uh, what we're looking for. And I couldn't even get in that position, not because of my knee. It bothered my knee a little bit, but because of my ankles. I'd lost so much inversion from just having sports injuries in the past. You don't really miss inversion really a lot unless you try to do certain things specifically for inversion. Because, I mean, I'd been playing sports and playing. I, mean, I sprained my ankle a lot. That's another story in itself I'll get to. Um, but um, um, I, she showed me that, and then she showed me another air chair, which is basically like the old basketball torture exercise where you'd sit on the wall and just sit there until the coach told you. But it's a little bit different because uh, you're go to find it. You're working on that, setting the bow. It's the, the squat is like the landing position. And um, so she gave me these two, and um, they hurt like all get out because my knee was just in bad shape still. And, but the more I did it, um, within just like a couple of months, I'm squatting pain-free. I mean, literally squatting to depth, sitting in a squat pain-free. And I mean, I figured, you know, there's got to be something to this, right? And, and of course, Lynn and I have been friends for a long time. And so I would just keep bouncing stuff off of her. And she kept, you know, sending me, you know, information. And so obviously that just, you know, got me to go. And um, and then again, once you start going through the, um, it's basically, it's, it's just basically like slow motion video work and just looking at how the injuries occur and how most people move and how these people move. I think you, Lynn, Lynn had talked to you about that. He looked at the four different groups, toddlers, age group athletes, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, even up to, even up to 100 years old. that are still running and moving uh, without a lot of pain. And then uh, indigenous people and then the age group, I mean, the super athletes, the Michael Jordans, the Tom Brady's and realized that they all kind of move the same. And I sure as heck didn't move anywhere like those guys. And so, but once you, once you understand the concept, it just makes, it makes sense. And a hundred times out of a hundred, an ACL shred happens exactly the same way. And um, even, a, even someone who's a GOTA, like Michael Jordan, he actually broke his foot even when he was the, the GOTA 10. But even if you're GOTA and you land the wrong way, you're still vulnerable. And what happened to him his second year, he basically was running a fast break and someone hit him. He, in his, that little uh, 10, 10, 10, uh, 10 part documentary, he said, you know, Someone hit him and he landed flat footed. So, you know, there, there's no getting away from it. You're playing Russian roulette when you do these things. Um, but what we try to do is wash all those behaviors out so that when you're on the sports field, it's all about moving forward. And, that, and I hate to say this, but CrossFit basically decodes you. So if you're going to be a CrossFitter, you should, I'm sorry, if you're going to be nothing wrong with that being a CrossFitter, but if you're going to be a, a, a football player, a basketball player, anything that's going to have you moving forward changing directions you shouldn't be doing crossfit and again that's painful for me to say because all of those lifts train the feet to do the wrong thing I and mean, we need we need sports we need athletic behavior to be uh you know ingrained we don't need to have to think about hey i'm getting ready to, to, to juke this guy my foot needs to do this while i'm going that way it needs to be just second nature and unfortunately we don't realize that we're training the central nervous system to have that behavior that that that, that um it ruptures the ACL um, with that with those lifts because you're telling the brain it's okay to have your toe out. You're telling your brain it's okay to let your knees collapse in, so that when you're running full speed, six to eight times your body weight, and you make that cut, and you're you're used to letting that foot turn out. Well, guess what it's going to do when you're running full speed and not thinking about it, and then you cut the other way, and that's how the ACL shred happens every single time. And we're not talking about contact. We're talking about you should never put your foot in the ground and have your knee explode on you. And they're having a, a epidemic of that the last, you know, several years. And the guys in GOTA and GLS in the, in, in, in New Orleans, as well as the athletes, the coaches around the world, not one ACL shred has happened in their years of doing this, not one Achilles shred. Now, granted, there's this one Buffalo Bills guy who did, who is GOTA and he did have an Achilles shred, but he'll tell you his Achilles had been shredded. That's how he found GOTA from his previous surgery on the other side and they bought him like three more years signed a new contract made millions of dollars but then he stepped back the wrong way because line he's a lineman and linemen are taught how to you know they they are if you listen to coaches teach the linemen they're teaching them wrong they're teaching them to push off their their big toe in that position he stepped back in a woda position and it popped on him but but he'll 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 defend it to the today because now he's excited because he he has a he has a, a game plan now to get back when he when he does his surgery which he should have had his surgery long ago by now but um, but um, but GOTA um, is basically the, the the pattern that we should all be doing, and it's very easy once you once you slow things down in slow slow motion video to a 
well, you don't need slow motion video to see the, the world of patterns. It's once you see it, you can't unsee it. But the really cool thing about it, and these guys are way better at it than I am, Coach Gary and Coach Ricky and Coach Gilly and even Lynn as well. They can literally look at the slow motion video and they can tell you what's wrong with it. And I'm, I can do that to a degree, but uh, they're much better at it. They've got such a keen eye. It just comes down to watching video. Yeah. So I'm understanding here that the key is change the patient's behavior and habits or like how they walk, how they move. So how do you help a patient to change this behavior? Yeah, I love that. That's what one thing that Coach Gary uh, at GLS, he's the godfather over there that, that runs the, the performance center. And that's one of the things he's talked about. And, and that's essentially what we're doing in MDT. I mean, if you think about it, like I said, is MDT is not fluff. You've got to, you've got to, you're trying to teach the patient how to um, manage themselves. Uh, you know, what's better for them to come to see us one or two or three times a week or, or to manage themselves five or six times a day. Uh, but you've got to, you know, we're always trying to sell MDT as to the right approach uh, to get them to do that right thing. Uh, but but, you're, you, but you have to educate them on how to, how to, you know, back injuries, for instance, how they happen. You know, 66% of the time, it's not trauma. It is no apparent reason, right? And the no apparent reason, well, there is a reason. It's our patterns. It's our, it's our, our body, uh, body mechanics and our poor posture, slouching all day. I used to always laugh at when I had a CrossFit box and I used to always taught the morning classes and, um, you know, we're doing deadlift for instance, one day and they, they had these people that are, they're afraid to increase their deadlift because they don't want to hurt their back. Um, but yet they, they don't think anything about going and sitting eight hours in crappy posture. They don't realize that that's way worse because at least with that deadlift, you're really working on your, your, the proper technique, but who, who goes and sits in a chair for eight hours and thinks about, Oh, they, they've got to sit the right way. They don't, they let themselves just kind of collapse and hang on, hang on their ligaments. Because it's easy. It actually takes effort to work on sitting up straight and tall. It takes effort to, to stand the right way. And so we're just, you know, we're just a society of, you know, technology is awesome. Chairs, I mean, I'm sorry, computers, cars, refrigerators, so we don't have to go kill our own food, but it's making us lazy. It's, it's all get out. And, um, and so you have to, first of all, help them understand, help them know that you know what the problem is and show them these movement patterns. We, we, we show them, basically I have a, at GLS, they have this great setup um, of, of all these pictures that show here's the, here's the good. We want you in your columns. We want your feet straight. We want back chain dominant. And here's the bad. And, um, and, and basically, Gary always says, whenever I put them through the, the storyboard, they, they break out the checkbook because it just makes sense. I don't have enough space for that great checkbook, that great um, uh, storyboard. But I do have, a, you know, on my iPhone, my iPad, I've got some of the, the pictures that kind of show. You know, this is how these guys move, these guys that have played a long time that haven't gotten hurt. And now after we do your video, let's look and see how you move and how you match up. So they get it. I mean, they get it right away. I say, oh, I don't move anything like that. I mean, because you, you can't mistake it. You know, the, the, you know, it's like it, it's just like men and women. When you're running the right way, you just look better. When you when you're a goat and you're, you're it's, it's just like um, it's just like poetry in motion. You're it, it, everything is and it's, it's and it's all about transfer of energy, the correct energy when you're. When you're not moving the right way, you're throwing energy out somewhere. You know, I like to use the example, think about baseball pitchers. Well, they can actually, you know, stop Tommy John surgery and stop rotator cuff surgery. And it just makes sense because you're trying to transfer energy from your foot out your hand. The energy of the ball goes from your foot through your body out the hand. Well, if you're letting, if you've got some, some sticky spots in your, in your mechanics, and that energy is somehow not able to get transferred purely through that hand, it's going to break down somewhere. And where does it typically break down? The, the smallest, the weakest link. And where's the weakest link? Your, your shoulder and your elbow, the smallest joint. And, um, and that's all it is. That's why we tear our knees up because we're, the energy is getting, it wants to just, we, we want to, to, to rotate from side to side. That's all walking and running is. It's just transferring that energy from side to side over and over. And when there's somewhere that energy is getting lost, um, it's, it's tearing your knee up because you're now the knees not the hips not rotating the way it's supposed to, and you're you're not getting that heel away all day. Your ankles dropping, and so you're basically just losing energy. And and if you think about it, um, uh, I think Lynn mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, that they guarantee six to twenty six percent performance improvement. And if you think about that, that's pretty that's pretty ballsy to think about. But but it just makes sense because if I'm running a forty yard dash, an NFL forty yard dash, that's one of the biggest biggest metrics out there. And it's very applicable because you're, 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 how fast can you get up and going is really important in football. Well, if I can take, if, if I've got someone that every single step, their ankle is dropping a little bit, that inside ankle bone drops, 
every single step is dropping and has to rise up and drop and rise. I mean, that's that's how many fractions of a second can I help them take off that 40 yard dash in an NFL fractions of a second, that's millions of dollars. And um, so just changing the way we move, we are transferring energy more efficiently. Therefore we're moving better. Therefore we're stopping that joint wear and tear. We're stopping, we're getting back chain dominant. So we're stopping that, just keeping our spine compressed all the time. I mean, chairs are just killing us. Um, and as you back to your original question, how do you change behavior? You just keep showing that every way you can MDT is the same way you have to, sometimes you have to explain, you know, a lot of people are getting, getting ready, getting rid of the disc model because you can't really, you can't really um, prove that anymore, but I still love the disc model and, and it resonates with some people. I just talk about sticky joints sometimes and that resonates with some people. You're always trying with even the MDT. What is the proper explanation for what you're trying to get across? To, to connect with this person because you have people that have no education to, you know, people that have a lot of education. You have to kind of meet them at that level. And I think that's what makes a good clinician is you have to understand that not everybody learns the same way. And same thing with MDT and everybody get, I mean, same thing with GoDA, everybody gets the slow motion video. You cannot deny that Tom Brady, who looks like me, got a dad bod, has no business being on a football field. When you look at him with, that, with his clothes off, but when you look at him on the field, he moves like butter. He still, you cannot argue. I'm a Peyton Manning fan, so it pains me to say this, but the dude's 45 still playing. You've got to give him props, and it's not coincidence that he's still playing. And so it's that, those movement patterns, just, it, and again, like I said, just the more you do it and the more you see it, you can't unsee it, and it just makes so much sense. So the, the, the getting them to change their behavior is helping them see that you know what the problem is, and this is the roadmap to get you there. And, and, and like I said, with workman's comp patients, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It is a challenge. It's a challenge just to get them to do their normal home exercise program, much less try to get them to live in the rocker position. Cause those guys, those go to guys are saying, Hey, they don't have any, any medical training. There are no, there are no doctors. I mean, there are chiropractors. Now there are some doctors that are doing this physical therapists, but I mean, they just, they're trainers, but they say, go, you got back pain, go live in this rocker for a week and come back and see me. There's other things to do that. But but there's plenty of them that say, just go live in this rocker. And it's such a good decompressive position. They come back better because they're no longer sitting in a chair all day, every day. They're not, you know, they can't go to work. So what, what or, or they can't go to school because they're hurting. So what do they do, they sit around all day. So the, it's, it's all about teaching them what they're doing on a day by day basis. That's contributing to their problem. And then once you get them to, to buy into that, man, it's, it's game on. And then do you do that, just curious, about repetitive movement or you do sustained positions or oh, none of that? To, oh, 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 oh yes. kind of both because um, both, you have to do both. Like the air chair uh, is a great a static position to load that bow because there's another position called the drop in. And the drop in is basically you're simulating landing on the leg. When, when you're running, you're, you're dropping in on one leg and then you just back and forth side to side. Well, that is a high level position. Uh, athletes will get it better, but especially when I'm trying to teach it to people that, that aren't athletes, you can't, you can't teach them to, to drop, to, to repetitively do it right away because it's such a high level position. You're trying to teach them to, to lift up on, the, on one foot. I'm sorry, they're standing on one foot, on the ball of their foot, outside edge of that foot, turning the knee out 22 and a half degrees, turn the chest out 22 and a half degrees. And, you, and one of the hardest things for people to get is to drive that hip back because you want all of the tension to be in your low back the, the low back into your butt and your hamstring, not uh, your quad. And because um, we don't want to be quad dominant, we want to be hamstring dominant. And um, and so without a doubt, you're, you use, again, just like MDT, you use whatever tool. And that's the thing. You have so many more tools now with GoTo, uh, all the different um, the uh, different movements. But you use static if you have to kind of back up and put the training wheel, so to speak, and give them some support. Uh, we back it all the way down, even just to the ground. You can do some of the stuff with in the, on the ground that kind of helps you work back up to get back on the standing. Uh, but it's just, it's just brilliant because um, it's, it's just, again, mechanical MDT clinicians are going to get this because it's just mechanical. It's me mechanically changing mm -hmm. bad behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you can just tell us briefly, general terms, what would be the best way to mechanically walk, run, throw? Like, do you have any tips for us just to give us an idea of, you yeah. gave some examples of toes up and ankle bones in and all of that. So something just popped into my head when you said it about the throwing. Um, Coach Gary, again, the godfather in New Orleans, um, 
I was on social media. He's, he's a, he's a master too at just marketing, networking on social media. But he, uh, year or so ago, there was a pitcher who was a bullpen pitcher. I don't know if it was college or semi pro pro. I, I can't remember, but he just sent Gary a shout out about how he had one of his best outings or something to that effect. Uh, you know, his, his velocity was better and all this stuff. And I said, Hey Gary, what'd you do? What kind of, you know, mechanics, what would you do as, as far as his pitching mechanics? And he just said, I didn't do anything but fix his feet. And that's so simple and yet correct, because if you don't start, especially with pitching, it's about, again, the efficient transfer of energy. And all the guy did was fix his feet and show him how to set bows and corner his hips. And automatically, I mean, we had a kid there when I was doing my lab who literally in, in a couple of months put 10 miles, 10 miles an hour on his fastball uh, just by, again, fixing his feet. And of course, at some point in time, there's natural ability in there. But I mean, you're, what these guys are doing is maximizing that ability by doing taking out anything and everything that makes him inefficient. But going back to your question, um, uh, very simple. The simple concepts are you have to have straight feet. You, you, you know, it's like see, and finding a goat is like finding a unicorn. You go to the mall, you get which I don't know if anybody goes to the malls anymore. But if you go to the airport, you go anywhere, there's a lot of people and just start watching feet. I mean, everybody's everybody's duck footed and duck feet is the tow road to destruction. As soon as you start turning out, it basically your your inside ankle bone has got to drop because you're moving forward and your t- your foot's turned out, uh, and the ankle is going to drop. And when that ankle drops, it takes the knee with it, it takes the hip with it, it takes the back with it. So somewhere in that chain, you're going to have problems. And the biggest problem is typically you know knee pain, but you have plenty of back problems as well. And it was so funny whenever I went to the course. Every single time I've went to three to the lab three times, I've taken a, one of my therapists. I went a couple times. I took another therapist. And um, it's, all these trainers have the same story. You know, they're trying to find better ways to move. They get it that they're, they're having issues. They're trainers. And they're all in good shape. But yet they're fine, Goda, because they're hurting. And what, what, what I'm seeing is what I'm hearing is MDT. And Lynn and I say the same thing. Oh, there's a lateral derangement. There's a lateral derangement because they all have they start with back pain and they start notice they get their hips start to bother them. And they start to have knee problems. And so but they're basically, you know, to the testament of Goda, they're basically fixing themselves with these go to movements because you're stopping bad behavior. You're stopping front chain dominant behavior. That's the biggest thing as well, that front chain behavior. But back to your question, I'm sorry, I can get off on these tangents, but feet straight. You got to be on the outside edge. If you look at your foot, if you just take your shoe off and look at your foot, there is no weight bearing surface on the inside of your foot. It's an arch and it's a cliff to fall off of as coach Ricky calls it. When that ankle drops, it takes the tibia with it. So you want to, you're trying to keep that inside ankle bone as high as you possibly can. And um, they call it the 20, the 45 degree pressure wave. So when you're landing with your foot straight, your, your knee should be turned out 45 degrees or 22 and a half degrees. Your chest should be turned out 22 and a half degrees. Uh, your, your shoulders is kind of cocked back your hands need to be, and your arms need to be doing a certain thing. And then when you just, you're just rotating back and forth, you do the same thing. So that 22 and a half to the right becomes 22 and a half to the left. So that's a 45 degree wave. And you're just repeating that back and forth and you're uh, and then moving up the chain and you're trying to set a bow. Your knees got to turn out and your, your, your chest needs to be up and your butt needs to be back. And the, what most people don't get, and this has been the hardest thing for me, they ride me every time I was going there, is that, that front chain versus back chain. And even I always thought that I was doing it the right way with my patients when I just tell them to lift their chest up and that, and that puts them into that lumbar lower doses we want, but it doesn't get you fully back chain. Back chain means that if you look at your hip bone, your lateral hip thigh bone, and you drop a, a plumb line down, it should fall on top of or slightly behind your ankle bone, and everybody falls within a few inches forward. So your hips are always, your hips and your back are always getting pushed forward. And, um, you know, I was at the MDT conference, uh, the uh, couple, of, uh, not a conference, the uh, in Tallahassee with you guys. And, um, you're just sitting there looking at all these MDT clinicians, these great clinicians who are certified in diploma, and you just see woda, 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 woda. And um, I have no doubt that there's that there's going to be pain there at some point in time. But luckily, these clinicians have a way to fix themselves really quickly. But I would just wonder how much more, you know, how much more they never never have any of these problems. If they do, I'm hypothesizing, of course, but I'm pretty confident about those hypotheses because what I've seen that um, how much can they, you know, everybody stop their own little nagging injuries. Yes, we can fix them, but how about let's stopping them? Miller, uh, in one of their studies, I guess they did in Tallahassee, talked about the um, the recurrence rate is what, 50 to 60% uh, low back injuries, low back pain comes back within a year. 
And it makes sense because, you know, patients are all the same. Once they start to feel better, they fall back into, into what brought them there, so to speak. Uh, they fall back in those bad habits. They stop the exercises and then it happens again. And um, that recurrence rate goes down to less than 10% when we maintain in range extension. Well, I think we can get that recurrence rate close to zero if we get everybody's feet straight, if we work on have them setting bows in corners and, um, and we work on back chain dominance. Back chain dominance is uh, pivotal. And my battery may be going here soon as we talk about it. But, um, but, 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 but as far as keeping reduction, um, one of the most important things is that, that back chain dominance. Okay. So if you have like a quick tip to give to PTs that don't know much about GOTA, like that they should pay attention, patterns that they should pay attention with their patients, other like than the straight feed that you said, like anything else, like a quick tip to give to clinicians? Well, the biggest thing is the straight feet. And, and again, remember the weight bearing should be on the outside edge. You want to make sure there's no push. You're not designed to push off that big toe. I know that's a bone of contention with some runners, but you're not designed to push off the big toe. Uh, and like I said, um, and, and how do we know that? Like I've had patients that tell me that without even trying, they're running faster once they start this movement pattern. It just makes sense. Because when you become back chain dominant, you also become work. You become, you're working with gravity. You're literally falling forward like the pose. If you know anything about the pose running method, Nicholas Romanoff, I mean, he said he's fixed tens of thousands of running injuries by just fixing their running mechanics. And all he's doing is getting them on the ball of their foot. Now, granted, he doesn't talk about anything about the big toe. He's, he allows you to run off the big toe. But, but when you're moving forward and falling forward and letting your hamstrings just kind of help you, you know, catch your legs up with you from behind, you're not driving the whole weight of your body in the ground every single time. You're not having to lift the whole weight of your body up every single time. And so um, that's the biggest thing, feet straight outside edge. And then your, your rib cage, the other big thing that we don't ever pay attention to, your rib cage has to be in front of your butt. Um, you know, you, think, you look at the military and you talk about how the military, they stand up to attention. Well, they're standing up in a front chain position. They're not standing up with their butt back as much as they should be. But rib cage in, in front of your butt is, is a huge. And when your rib cage doesn't, um, when your rib cage stays on top of your butt, um, those back muscles literally shut off. So that's where some of that compression comes from. So when you lift your chest up, you push your butt back, you literally get taller and you, you're elongating that spine, which is de decompressing that spine. And I always tell patients to push back until you feel those muscles engage again, show, have them move forward again and see those muscles turn off. Uh, and then just kind of work that. That's kind of their own little biofeedback system. Uh, and then once they get it, they get it. And it does take time. It takes time for people. It's, it's hard to get people to, even just to push back far enough to get those muscles engaged when they're older and they've been sitting all day. So it's a challenge yeah. sometimes. And final question about this topic. I know you're almost out of time here. Um, so how do you identify these worst of all time movers that you just mentioned before the water? Easy. I mean, that's slow motion video is key for getting the minutia, every little thing that, 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 that we need to try to, to change the behavior of these athletes. But, but the, with the naked eye, it's just everybody is um, their hip, their, their hips are pushed forward. Their toes are turned out. Um, and, um, they're the, the biggest thing too, is you just see those ankles collapsing in. It's just, it's painful to watch. And when you slow, mo when you slow, do slow motion video and you see, you slow down them running and you see those ankles collapse, it's just it's kind of painful to watch and you get how, and they get it too, how they're hurting because your ankle is just not designed to do that. It's not designed to collapse in with your toe turned out that way. And especially six to eight times your body weight, Tim Hewitt with, um, uh, that had a podcast with Tim Hewitt, Jason Ward did with his mechanical care forum. Um, he's an ACL guy at the Mayo Clinic, and he says it takes 500 uh, pounds of pressure to, um, to to rupture the ACL. Well, you're putting you know three to four times your body weight um, with just jogging, six to times your body weight um, with sprinting and cutting and pivoting. So uh, those are both even just with jogging. I've had patients that blew their ACL out doing nothing; they just stepped the wrong way and tore their tore their ACL, and that should never happen, by the way. Uh, but the forces are there just in everyday life with walking, especially in running. Um, and so it's very easy to, um, to change those behaviors by, by fixing the feet. But that's the biggest thing you're going to see is toe out and those ankles collapse. And once you get, you, once you understand what back chain is, you understand that everybody's back chain dominant. And how can you not be when we spend uh, all day sitting in chairs? Because that's, that's basically training front chain dominant behavior. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to transition now to the final questions. Do you have anything else to uh, talk about Goda before we 
transition to general questions? No, I mean, well, I guess, yes, I would. I guess, um, again, all my friends that know me know I say this all the time that McKenzie was a genius and Coach Gill is a genius. The guy's brilliant. He's not a, he's a businessman who was on a mission to not, not accept having his back fused at a young age, uh, which would have just ruined him uh, being such a big guy. And, um, but he's a genius as well. And just to hear him talk, his, he, you listen to Gary and, and Ricky, they're geniuses. I mean, they're uh, really good. It's, I, I, I equate, honestly, I, I equate Ricky and Gary as to, 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 to Herbawi and Miller. They're, they're basically on that level as far as the, being uh, good at the slow motion video. But Coach Gilly's on another level as just far as just you hear him talk and he's, he's uh, you know, uh, just on another level intellectually. But and obviously that you know that's the case because he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's independently wealthy due to all of his businesses. And he's told me, you know, I had businesses that failed, but he just kept going and kept, kept going. And, and now he, he, like I said, he, he um, would play golf all day, every day if he could. And he pretty much does most of the time. So, so um, it's the real deal. I mean, anybody that's, that's, you know, I know that Lynn got me, I'm MDT. I'm a diploma. She's a diploma. Scott uh, in, uh, in uh, Tennessee, he's MDT. He's been down there with those guys in, in, uh, in Tallahassee. He's getting it. So it's not rocket science. We, the more people, I think there's even some other clinicians that are getting ready to start going through it. Once you see it, as we say, you can't unsee it. And so it just makes sense. So it's only, especially if you guys out in private practice, it's only going to enhance what you do because who else is out there videotaping their, their clients? I mean, that's a, that's a selling mm-hmm. point in of itself. And, yeah. and once you start doing that, once you start showing those people themselves in slow motion video and how this is how the, the people that are doing it right do it and this is how you do it. I mean, there's no faking that. And there's no uh, denying that. Uh, you know, they, so, so that's, that in and of itself, that's a kind of good point as far as you guys out there, they're doing your cash practice and they're doing your, um, you know, just practice however you're doing your practice. But, but that's a great point itself to, to, to just give it a shot and hear it out. Because once some of the, once some of the more, uh, once more and more people in MDT are doing this, they're going to get it. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to, uh, it's going to take off even more. So it's getting there. And like I said, it's getting there even more and more because you've got more and more uh, athletes that are that are pro uh, pro football, basketball, baseball that are getting into it. So it's only going to build that way as well because they get it and they're the ones. And that's the craziest thing. You think that they already have the greatest of care, but just ask Tiger Woods and just ask Peyton Manning. They can tell you they don't have the best care because Tiger Woods is what is on his fifth back surgery and Peyton Manning had four back surgery and his career was cut short. So because they couldn't figure it out. So um, it, it, it's coming. And, um, but I'd encourage everybody just to have an open mind. It's, it seems crazy. You got these guys who aren't, who aren't, uh, medical people at all, but trust me, um, I fancy myself a pretty good clinician and I couldn't fix my own knees. Uh, but when I started doing this, just starting moving and I, and I'm still, I, I have to fight it every day as well, because I still, I've got a, a business. I'm on my computer doing notes all the time. I mean, you, you, you can't get around the, the decode that is life. Um, and, and I'm, I'm in Hawaii. So when I travel, I'm always traveling, you know, six to eight hours to, you know, sorry, minimum six to eight, you know, my, you know, maximum anywhere from 12 to 15. So, um, we're being decoded all the time. So to recognize that and start working on, you know, changing those movement patterns is, is critical. Yeah, no, that's great. It looks like a great tool to complement everybody's treatment. Um, Lee, final questions. What is your favorite resource of information? Anything you want to share? Yeah, you know, I'm, uh, I never was the most huge literature fan. I get it. It has its place. Um, but, I mean, when I think back, the things I remember, I really love, I think everybody should be on, they should know the McKinsey books. You know, you don't ever think that you, you learn everything in McKinsey's books. Whenever I was going through the diploma program, I wasn't as well-versed as I should have. And as I just started learning, reading them again, you definitely uh, still continue to pick stuff up. I I wish they would, they would have a a new edition. They just kind of, because things have still changed so much, but there's still so much knowledge there. I always love Audrey Long's, uh, you know, direction matters because we know without a doubt, exercise is important. When, when all else fails, move, don't be sedentary as the enemy, be as active as you can, but we know without a doubt, direction matters. And a lot of people get better, um, you know, with low back pain. And that's why that recurrent rate happens because people get better because they just, they give, get medication from the doctor and just go toe the rest and they go do that and they get better and they get active and again. And, but unfortunately they didn't, the behavior was never changed and that there was a derangement in there. That derangement could never possibly have been fully reduced because you didn't do the right things. You kind of um, just allowed it to heal on its own. So that's an imperfect uh, uh, healing mechanism. And so um, you're always just trying to um, 
educate that, 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 that it's not about, it is about movement, but it's also the right movement. And that's the other thing too with MDT is we always say, we, we're not giving you a bunch of things to do. We're giving you the one right thing to do. Go away and do that. But that's, I think that was a pivotal paper. Um, and otherwise, I mean, honestly, the biggest thing now is, is social media and the Instagram as far as, especially with, with this GOTA stuff. And I see McKinsey's kind of, the McKinsey Institute's getting better about that as well over the last couple of years. Um, but, 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 but you can't go wrong by following uh, GLS, uh, GOTA, and uh, Red Pell Rick, and of course, Lynn and uh, go to loco on uh on instagram because that's just they're dropping knowledge bombs all the time awesome and what would be the best advice you give to clinicians that are starting their careers oh uh, that's a great question like i said if i wasn't doing mdt today uh i'd been out of physical therapy a long time ago because what we learn in school and i have pt students now i'm, I'm the old school bs so i'm a bs degree and i'm getting you know i have students all year, every year, uh, every year, all year. And the training is not getting any better. I mean, you're kind of beholden to what your instructors were taught, right? And how many instructors have, I mean, what do we learn about, uh, I mean, we, we all know that MDT, uh, to me, like I always love Miller's um, statement that MDT is not a tool in your box. It is the toolbox, but how many people you can get any MDT in, in school? And if they do, it's usually from someone that has no, no idea about it, but they're just t teaching what they know. And as you know, you ha we hear physical therapists all the time. Oh, I know McKenzie because I, I, you know, I had a course or I had, you know, I worked with somebody, but you don't know it unless you immerse yourself in it. I mean, those guys, and I think, I think Yoav out in Florida, he's teaching the, uh, at Florida, I think it's at Florida International. And they have no idea how lucky they are to actually have a McKenzie faculty guy teaching them. Um, but I would say get certified ASAP, uh, even if you have to pay on your, out of your own pocket, because it will pay dividends, especially if you're going to go into your own practice, because just uh, uh, it allows you just to be more to just speak more intelligently to your to the physicians, even though they don't understand a lot what you're what you're talking about. But at least you can talk to them about it with confidence. And I'd get through that as quick as possible. The extremities as well. And then when you do get certified, don't even try to think that you that you know enough because you don't. And I know that. I thought I was all that in a bag of chips, like I said, and I found out the harsh reality when I went through the diploma program. Um, you know, it, it, it takes about five to six weeks for them to break you down and build you back up. And that, that was that's what they said. And they were they were exactly right. So we all develop bad habits. And and so keep going, get certified, keep going to the courses. Don't ever think that, you know, because even as a diploma now, um, uh, since 2009, I'm still learning. I mean, even the even even MDT in general has evolved. I mean, when I went to when I went through all the courses. You know, the thoracic spine was, you know, 30 minutes on the, the last day of, of, of Sunday. Right. Uh, and, and still, I'm not sure what it is now, but I know what the guys in Tallahassee, they've made it a pivotal part of getting in there as soon as possible to check the thoracic spine. And, and that's what I tell all my students. If you've got somebody that's sticky in the low back or sticky in the neck, get in between. because That's usually where the problem lies, because if you're not moving above or you're not moving below, well, in between is obviously not going to be moving very well either. So get in there. But it's just continuing to evolve. and also just um, you know, McKinsey in general with the, the with the Millers, the Herbowies, the um, um, the Dana Greens, and the uh, Robert Medcast, and, and uh, that's enough. I mean, there's plenty more, but those guys, those brilliant minds, who took McKinsey's work and started seeing tons more patients, um, and and also you see a different population that McKinsey would be seeing potentially in New Zealand in a rural area. Or I'm not sure if he was in a rural area, but someplace in New York or or somewhere with different athletes and stuff, or just with just different patient populations because the jobs are different and just finding different ways to get a reduction. You know, there's, there's different, there's, you know, I always tell my patients that if I if standing on your head gives me the direct, the loading force to, to reduce the derangement, I'm going to use it. And when you're thinking mechanically, and that's another thing I tell my students, MDT is not a, an approach. It's a thought process. It's a mechanical thought process. It's understanding how the body works mechanically. And once you understand that, and once you understand how this person got in this, in this predicament of what, what, what caused their derangement, you may have to go outside the box to figure out a way to, to uh, get that reductive force because it may not be straightforward. I mean, there's been plenty of times where extension makes them worse and side glide isn't making them better. It's not helping. It's kind of making them worse. And so you have to play with angles with mobilizations. You have to play with angles with, with, um, with, their, with their positions. And, um, and so just don't ever think that you, that you got it because once you do that, you're going to be humbled quickly because I get humbled every day. Yeah, absolutely. And final question, what personal qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful therapist? Um, 
I think first and foremost, we should all be in good shape. We sure can't be giving advice on how to fix our problems when we're not in, in good shape. Um, and, um, and I think also the more active we are, um, the patient can identify with you better when they're active um, because you're kind of doing some of the same things uh, as not just sitting on the couch being sedentary. And I get that life gets in the way. I'm, I'm guilty of that right now. I'm not as active as I need to be because I've got a lot going on. I'm trying to replace a therapist right now and, and actually two therapists. Um, but that's one. And again, I think you just always need to continue to be, you know, searching out knowledge and uh, the right knowledge, of course. And I tell patients that all the time because, I mean, there's so much knowledge on the, on the Internet, but 90 percent of it is horrible. And even the MDT stuff, there's MDT stuff that's great. but There's MDT stuff that's not exactly what we would, you know, as MD, if, as MDT clinicians would say, hey, that's OK. Uh, but just always trying to get better and understanding that, that, that when you're coming out of school, you don't know anything. I don't mean that as, a, as an insult. But again, well, all they're doing in physical therapy school, and we've always said, I think I was talking with Dave Oliver, of course, one time, but we just tell people, just go to any physical therapy school. It really doesn't matter. Save your money. Don't go to the most expensive one. And then learn MDT, and you're going to be fine. And now learn MDT and go, and you're really going to be fine. Uh, but, just, but just don't think that you know it all, because that's, I, that is what frustrates me to no end when I have students that come in, and because they've been to a, a, to a, I had a clinical prior to me who wasn't MDT, and I start trying to teach them MDT and they act like that they know more than me. And I'm just like, dude, you've been out of, you're not even out of school yet. And, but you do have those. Those are few and far in between. But, um, but just understand that it's a, that, that it's, it's ever evolving. Always be humble. Your patients will humble you because that's what we're all here for is we're here to help them get better and uh, not about not puff up, our, puff up our own egos, which, you know, feels good sometimes when no one else could help somebody and you're able to centralize a bodge better on day one. But again, it's not about that. It's about helping the patient uh, 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 get back to where they want to be. But just always be humble and always keep searching for some more answers. Yes. I think that, yeah, that's very important because when you think you know everything and comes that challenging patient and you're like, well, that's not working. Why should I try now? That's exactly um, right. That's exactly right. And that's the cool thing, too. I'm, I'm del I've been delving into the last few years as well with Annie and Melissa and World of Hurt. And man, that is a, that, that, those chronic pain patients, that is a, 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 that they will humble you because that is a, a difficult patient population to work with. And I've got a couple right now that are, that are definitely um, challenging me, but not that GOAT is fixing these people, but that definitely gives you some more tools, some non-threatening uh, things that you can do um, to just start getting them to move better, which can help with their pain. Because if, they're, if they've got faulty movement patterns, that central nervous system uh, loop that's just got them overstimulated with pain. Um, when you start trying to right the ship and move better, that can help out with those as well. That's another one I should throw in there because anything we can do to help out those those chronic pain patients because they're they're definitely a, a whole different breed of patients. Yeah, that's very interesting because if you're not able to help, at least change their mechanics. You know that that's going to help them at some point. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Long term, at least they'll they'll stop tearing themselves down for sure. You can't really, as Coach Gill says, like I can't I can't prevent, or I'm sorry, I can't undo this bony lesion of my kneecap, um, but I can prevent future injury, and I can obviously move better. And that's the other thing. When I run, I, I, I'm working on getting back to running the right way. I'm still I'm walking. I've got it. I've got the back chain when I'm walking, uh, but when when I'm moving, sometimes not so much. But running is still a challenge. Because if you're not walking great, you're sure not going to run great because you're speeding that pattern up. But I can tell when I'm not right, running the right way. And again, I'm not perfect because my knee hurts. Because when that when that foot lands the wrong way, um, I'm definitely collapsing that 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 um, that kneecap onto that part of the knee where it got hurt. And when I start getting my butt back more and I start setting that bow and, and, and getting that knee turned out, I mean it's my own little bio uh, bio feedback right now. So. Without a doubt, uh, you can't undo those those that the, the damage you've done if you've done too much. But without a doubt, I've had plenty of total knee replacements that actually get better as we start getting them that rocker position. And you know, uh, without a doubt, as we know, a lot of knee place, knee patients respond to repeated flexion. Uh, degenerative changes can respond to repeated flexion. Well, guess what? We spend everybody spend time getting everybody in is that rocker that that that, that knee flexion. So. Um, what a great uh, what a great position to start your total knee uh, your, not your total knees your uh, arthritic knees in to loosen them up they look at you like you got three heads because they probably haven't been in on their hands and knees in the, in a position like that since they were toddlers uh, but once they once they get it and they start seeing you know, it's, it's 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 not unusual for them to come back the next visit noticing their knees better because they and, it's, and it just makes sense too 
I, I always tell my patient, what's going to be better with an arthritic knee, a, a screwed up, strong, flexible knee or a screwed up arthritic stiff knee? You know, just common mm-hmm. sense. No matter how arthritic the knee is, the joint is, you want it to be as loose as possible. You know what I mean? So stiffness ain't, it's not good for anybody. Yeah. No, that's very cool. Lee, um, if people want to learn more about you, your work or contact you, how they can find you? Sure. And I'm absolutely happy to talk to people about Gota because again, I'm, I am, I am, I'm reinvigorated. Like I said, I'm still on fire today about MDT as I was back in 1999. And I will never lose that because McKenzie changed my life. Miller, Herbawi, Wadi, they all changed my life. Um, but Gilly is onto something, man. And I mean, you, you've got these million dollar athletes that are, that are and their agents that are coming to them. They're, they're basically validating that they're onto something there. So I'm at, at Island underscore Gota on Instagram. Um, my email is outrigger70 at yahoo.com. And I'm happy to talk to anybody because like I said, um, it's coming whether we just want to be a part of it or not, it's coming. Awesome. Lee, thank you so much for taking your time and share with you, share with us all your knowledge about Gota MDT. I think it's amazing. Uh, and open new horizons and new possibilities of us that we are all about body mechanics and, and makes total sense. So I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. And um, you can tell all your listeners if they need to get some sleep tonight, just throw this in. That'll probably put them right to sleep. But most importantly, <laughs> most importantly, congratulations on becoming a citizen. Welcome Yay, aboard. Yay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was great to meet you and tell you and the group of girls you were hanging out with in Tallahassee. And uh, yeah. yeah, we'll stay in touch and we'll see you and hopefully a conference coming up soon. Awesome. Yes. Bye-bye, Lee. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.